Jeremiah chapter 49 and verse 10. But I have made Esau bare. I have uncovered his secret places, and he shall not be able to hide himself. His seed is spoiled, and his brethren, and his neighbors, and he is not. Shalom, brothers and sisters. This is your brother, Hawaiyala. I want to give all glory and praises to our Heavenly Father, Yahweh. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Yahweh Shai, peace, grace, and mercy be abound to the whole full elect that are hearing of the words of the gospel of our Lord and Savior and enduring to the end, uh, showing forth the faith uh, that has been bestowed upon us uh, by the mercy and will of the Heavenly Father. Uh, for by that, we are able to please him. And we know that through the works of righteousness, uh, which we'll, we are to follow according to the scriptures, uh, that he will continue to guide those that have faith in him and in his resurrection, uh, whether you be dead or living, that you may be able to inherit everlasting life. Wanted to go into uh, basically another part of the series, which is who is Esau Edom. And as you know, um, we've already done part one of the Roman Empire series. Um, this is going to be part one uh, dealing with you know, who are the Edomites uh, today, you know, basically, uh, according to many sources um, that are out there, but one of those that I'm pulling up is going to be uh, from about a couple of hundred years ago, uh, in which this was uh, brought to attention uh, to, you know, many people that were probably readers at that time of what their identity truly is and how uh, that is to be found out and then what that identity means uh, for those people moving forward. So basically, what I'm going to do, we're going to go first into that book. Okay, so this is the book, and I'm going to go ahead and go to the title page. All right, so right here, the book is called Modern Judaism. Okay, it says, or a brief account of the opinions, traditions, rites, and ceremonies of the Jews in modern times. All right, this is by John Allen. This is the second edition revised and corrected, and it was published by R.B. Seeley and W. Burnside. This is in London, England, United Kingdom, and this was published on the year of 1830. Okay, so that's what that says right here is 1830. So what we're going to do, we're just going to go ahead and get straight to the page. Okay, so we're going to go down to page uh, 231, and we're going to go ahead and read... Uh, what the author kind of brought a, a foreshadowing of what was going to be brought out concerning the descendants of Esau. So we'll go ahead and read it from here. Esau's descendants are the subjects of extensive traditions in which the rabbis with an affrontary at which we should wonder in any other men have set at the defiance all authentic history and accurate chronology. These representations, the fallacy of which will be too obvious to require being pointed out, may be briefly comprised under the following heads. So what uh, the author tried to do um, with this book was try and basically say this, what they're doing is summarizing what our uh, forefathers in the Middle Ages said concerning uh, the people that were Edomites, okay? So many of this would have been written during the time or information would have been written during this time as Esau was taking over, you know, Europe, okay? So what this man is trying to do, John Allen, he's trying to basically say that what the information that they put out was not credible and was not according to the chronology. Now, why is it important for us to talk about that? Because John Allen was a deflector in his time of what the truth was, you know? Definitely was more than likely an Edomite, okay? Because we know that our people were in captivity in 1830. And as you know, um, if you know anything about 1830, around 1830 was when slavery was beginning to be abolished in many of the British colonies um, outside of, of course, the, you know, North America. And then, of course, you had the other countries having their own languages, whether it's Spain, Spanish, you know, the Spanish, the French, the Portuguese, uh, the Dutch. They had their own col colonies along with other uh, so-called European empires right so this particular information is really relevant to it's very to the time in which this was uh published and and uh written all right so what we're going to do we're going to go into what was said so first that the descendants of esau the sworn enemies of the descendants of jacob even 
to the end of the world, okay, were at first a small nation inhabiting Mount Seir and the adjacent country contiguous to the land of Canaan, that they were easily confined within their own limits as long as the Israelites enjoyed a great and formidable empire in Canaan. And this is very true because when during the time of uh, King David and King Solomon, we had basically domination over the Edomites, okay? And that's the reason why they were only they were confined within their borders because they were our subjects, okay, up until the time of the fall. Now, before we get into, uh, you know, the rest of this particular paragraph, we're going to go ahead and go in dealing with the beginning part, which it says that the descendants of Esau, the sworn enemies of the descendants of Jacob, even to the end of the world, okay? So let's go ahead and go back, and we're going to pull up that information. This is uh, Ezekiel chapter 25, verse 12. Thus saith the Lord Yahweh, because that Edom had dealt against the house of Judah by taking vengeance and greatly offended and revenged himself upon them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord Yahweh, I will also stretch out my hand upon Edom and will cut off man and beast from it. And I will make it desolate from Teman and they of the Dan shall fall by the sword. And I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel, and they shall do in Edom according to my anger, according to my fury, and they shall know my vengeance, saith the Lord Yahweh. Okay? Now, why are we bringing this up? Because when you go into this, the children of Edom, all right, the descendants of Edom had had, uh, you know, that hatred upon us and had avenged themselves on us. Okay? All right, so now we're going to deal with Ezekiel chapter 35 and 5. Because thou has had a perpetual hatred and has shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword in the time that their calamity and in their time of their iniquity had an end. Okay? This is talking about Edom. If you go through the beginning of this chapter, okay, it's talking, saying the Lord is prophesying against Mount Seir, which will get, you'll, you'll see that word pop up in the book, which we'll get into as well. And then, of course, because of that, we'll get back to this, but going back to this book, that's the reason why it gets into the hatred, okay? Again, the sworn enemies of the descendants of Jacob. Now, as we go down back here, right, we'll just read from this paragraph, as long as the Israelites enjoyed a great and formidable empire in Canaan, but that after the powerful republic of the 12 tribes, which was the unified kingdom under David and Solomon, was destroyed by the, Babel, the Assyrians and Babylonians, they wonderfully increased in numbers and strength and extended their dominion toward the West. Okay? Now, why is it this place known as the Western world? And who controls the Western world? Okay, the West was referring to <clears throat> their control of Europe and the dominion that they had over the New World, which, remember, this was written in 1830s, okay? So they not understand that their dominion over time went towards the West. Now, it's going to give you a pinpoint time frame of what um, started their trajectory in power and where they started from as far as their base outside of the land of Edom. And it says they spread their colonies far and wide, what? Mainly towards the West, okay, including the Americas, subjugated Italy, founded the Rome and Roman Empire. Now, remember, that's one of the reasons why we had to go into who is Esau, Edom, the Roman Empire, because we're showing you, again, a link to Esau's descendants and the founding of Rome and the Roman Empire. So that, again, that's evidence that corroborates the first lesson. Continuing on at length, entirely overturned the Jewish state, which had been restored after the termination of the Babylonian captivity. Okay, now this particular Jewish state that they're referring to is the Hasmonean dynasty, which was under the Maccabee brothers. Okay, that basically was overturned uh, by the family of, uh, of Herod, okay, during the time of the Roman Empire. When the Romans came into power, they basically got allied with um, the family of Herod or Antipater, and uh, who was known as Antipater the Idumean, which means Antipater the Edomite, and then his sons after him. And through that union, they were able to overthrow uh, the power structure of our people that was in the, the state of Judea, which was basically considered an autonomous uh, state. If you read the book of Maccabees, they let their state, the state of our people, be independent from the hegemony of the Greeks. 
during that time period until the time of the Romans came. Um, so that's why it's important to understand history and what they're referring to when you read this. So you understand it's not talking about modern day Italy at that time. It's not talking about the Jewish quote unquote Jewish state of this time, the false Jewish state uh, that we know about which that's called the Israelis, but we're talking about a different time period of our people dealing with our history. All right. So it says here, the second temple being destroyed by Titus Vespasian, which was of course, 70 AD. Some of you brothers and sisters are familiar with that. And it says, and that in the present day, okay, maybe in the present day. Now, when he's speaking present day, that's referring to 1830. And it will also be today as well, because nothing has changed since 1830 in terms of the power and the hegemony that the Edomites have and our subjugation under them, right? So we're going to read that again. And that in the present day, professing the religion of Jesus of Nazareth. So meaning that these descendants of Edom profess, remember, profess. They profess the religion of, of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, in other books that I've read in these same time periods, they called the Christianity that these Edomites kept the Roman religion because it wasn't based on what was written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the gospels and the epistles. Okay. So that's what they called it. They understood that the version of Christianity that the Edomites were under was a form of Roman paganism. That's why if you look up, uh, you call it, it's basically pagan Rome. Um, it's also known as pagan Christianity. Okay. This is what they really practiced and believed in, which included, you know, the false image as well. So it says, which they were the first of the, all the nations to embrace. So meaning that. Edomites, the descendants of Edom actually were the first people that had exposure to the religion, right, of Jesus of Nazareth, which was basically just done because of proximity, meaning that because of their subjugation under our people in the Middle Ages after the fall of Rome, they had an affinity of understanding or knowing about uh, the Bible and the whole story of it. And this is part of the problem that comes in place when it comes to our discussion with this Bible, especially with those of the detractors that don't want to believe it because they, they say that it's quote unquote, the so-called white man's religion. And therefore why should we follow that? And this is what has caused a lot of our people to go into, you know, uh, different branches of religion, such as, you know, Islam or nation of Islam, or to go into, um, so-called, uh, African native religions, such as like Ife, and or voodoo or vodun or santeria those type of uh different systems because of this particular misunderstanding okay which we'll definitely hopefully as time permits we'll dwell dwell into so what he's doing is he's breaking down who these people are and their what they believed in their characteristics and their dominion that they've had right so it says and then also that they meaning the descendants of Esau that they hold the dominion over all Europe. Esau detaining in captivity his brother Jacob at least as far as regards to the tribe of Judah till his Messiah Ben David shall appear meaning the Messiah Ben means son the son of David shall appear and they knew and understood that they had in captivity meaning in slavery they understood that they had that these Edomites had in slavery the tribe of Judah in particular and the rest of the tribes in subjugation as well. Now, this is written in 1830. Remember, here in Babylon and in many places throughout the New World and in different parts of the world, like, you know, you have different islands, you have different uh, islands off the coast of Africa, you have different places in uh, parts of Asia where they had people in our people in slavery, okay? Um, they understood that they had the children of Israel in captivity based off of this document. They had to have known, in particular, the, the Judah or the southern kingdom, you could say, right? Meaning in chattel slavery, the, slave, the victims of the, of the slave trade in particular. This shows you that even they understood that those that were, in, that were being traded as slaves on slave ships were primarily of the tribe of Judah. This is why it's very important to understand that in that time, they understood that not all 12 tribes faced the exact same concentration of judgment 
that the tribe of Judah had faced. Okay, so this even, again, this is one of the reasons why you have to understand that the Most High had, the, had different tribes in different places facing a varying degrees of different experiences in regards to the curses. Okay, and this proves it again. So, again, that they had dominion over all Europe. So, guess what? That means that the people primarily that are called Europeans would be the descendants of Edom. This is, says this in 1830. Brothers, is not sitting here making this stuff up. Remember, your four, our forefathers was not out for the most part. There wasn't many of our people that was writing these type of books. Okay, so you can't sit there and say that we're creating this doctrine. This is something that the likes of vocab alone, James White, and many of those uh, of our people that love their oppressor, they can't run away from this. Okay, so now we're going to deal with this second part. So it says, secondly, that the prophecies of the prophets against Edom, Esau, Seir, okay, so we remember we talked about Mount Seir, it's also up here as well, which was the native original land that Esau settled in, it's over in, would have been in modern day uh, Jordan today, but this is where they were originally until they were able to get out of their borders after the fall of our people. This is the known history and the cities of Edom. So let's see what they were talking about in regards to these prophecies, especially those of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Obadiah have not yet received their full accomplishment, meaning that the prophecies that are written concerning Edom and Mount Seir, Esau, Idumea, in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Obadiah, and in the rest of the books of the prophets have not received their full accomplishment, meaning they have not been fulfilled. For that though the house of Esau has experienced some particular judgments of God on the account of the injuries at different periods of time afflicted upon Israel. Let's go ahead and get that real quick. So we're going to have an example of that, which is in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3. And I saw one of his wounds as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Okay? Because he did receive a wound, but that wound was eventually healed, and we're in the time in which he's in his power seat after the wound was healed, okay? Which means that he was brought back to life. He was basically being able to give a what's called a rebirth. That is also where you get the word renaissance. Renaissance literally means rebirth. Even these Edomites know that they were left for dead for a period of time and they had a rebirth and a resurgence, which is what we're in the tail end of, okay? So now let's go ahead and go back to that yet the final vengeance on account of that last and greatest injury the destruction of the second temple by Titus and the transportation of the Jews into captivity so they know that Titus Vespasian and the Roman Empire were Edomites okay and the transportation of the Jews into captivity right meaning our people going into slavery in which they are still most appropriately Detained. So the word there, opprobriously, in fact, let me go ahead and pull that up real quick. So opprobrious, it says full of reproach. This is intended to bring disgrace. Okay. And that's what it was brought to. Reproach, a disgrace, a taunt, a proverb, a byword. That's the condition that we're in in this captivity. All right. So we're detained in a captivity that give, that is, has us full of reproach, okay, full of shame, okay, a taunt, a parber, a byword. This is a fulfillment of scripture, okay. This is the fulfillment fulfillment of the prophecies uh, that the prophets before had spoken of, okay. Is yet impending over it to be executed in the time of the Messiah. So meaning that their judgment is fully going to be made when the Messiah returns that this is foretold by the prophets in all their denunciations of the severest plagues against the house of Esau, the cities of Edom, okay, meaning the cities which they built and inhabited, okay, that means your all your, your cities in Europe, all your cities throughout the Americas, all your cities that are out in the Asia Pacific that they build and they maintain and control, okay, your cities in South Africa, your cities in uh in Alexandria or whatever, whatever area that they're at, Istanbul, Turkey, they are, those cities are going to receive judgments. 
Okay, because that's according to the word of the Lord. And it says, and Mount Seir, Mount Seir meaning the, their government. Because if you understand the Bible in terms of the Mount, what does Mount Zion mean? Mount Zion is really dealing with the, with the government structure of Israel. Mount Seir is dealing with the government structure of Edom. Okay, when you go into the summits, a summit means a mountain peak. You have the G8 summit, the G7 summit. These are different governments coming together, having meetings. These are the different, the, and these are known basically as mountains. A mountain is a structure, a government-based structure that goes up and down. At the top, you have the heads of state, and then it goes down, okay, further and further. Kind of like, quote-unquote, a pyramid, right? Because there's a structure and a wisdom behind that particular symbol that is understood globally, especially by the elites and those that are in the know and have wisdom, okay? So it says, which all belong to Rome and the Christians, meaning the pagan Roman Christians, meaning the Edomites, okay? That all this belongs to them. This particular judgment belongs to them, right? To Rome and their descendants and to their uh, particulars after them, right? It says and that the fate of Christians and these Christians that they're talking about is not talking about the true believing Christians, those that believe in the gospel of Yahweh Shai, okay? It's talking about the pagan Edomite Christians, okay? Because they're associated with that particular religion. At that time will be far more dreadful than that of the Muhammadians. So the Muhammadians would be the people that were believing Islam, primarily the Arabs. So they understood that the judgment that was going to come upon these Edomites was going to be greater that was the, that was going to happen to the Arabs. Okay? This is according to prophecy. It says, now, Abar Binel particularly says, the slaughter of the Turks in the future battle will not be so great as that of the Christians. For many of the Turks will escape, according to Isaiah 66 and 19, which he didn't understand that prophecy at that time, but what he's really referring to is that the slaughter of the Christians is going to be far greater than that in which would, would befall what they would consider Turks or Muslims, so to speak. Okay, now remember, if you go back to the first lesson, who was Esau Edom, you have to also understand that it was also known that the Ottoman Turks were, were also Edomites as well, meaning those that came out of the caves created the Ottoman Empire, took down the Byzantine, that those were Edomites, okay? Uh, we've already went over that before, so just for your information, just in case, because there was some confusion in this particular area of this uh, page, All right? So now going on, it says, but of the Christians, Obadiah says, there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, okay? So he's referring to these quote-unquote Christians, Okay, as being of the part of, of, of the house of Esau, meaning these Edomites that are professing themselves or profess themselves at that time when this was written to be Christians. Okay, which will again, Lord willing, we'll get into the whole religious aspect in regards to Esau and his relation to Christianity historically. Now, we're going to go ahead and deal with that Obadiah thing for the sake of truth. Okay, so. This is Obadiah chapter 1 and verse 18. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. And they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken it. Okay? Now remember, they understood that, and they understand who those are. Now, remember in regards to the Europeans, okay? So going back to this, we're going to go just a little bit back to the dominion, right, that they have over all of Europe, okay? And they hold the dominion over all of Europe. And let's go ahead and go into that, okay? So basically, when you go back into that time, there was a, a push to unify all the Edomites under a, what was known as a European unity, okay? And you see that they have the history of it, the early history of that thought. Okay. And even William Penn, okay, which uh, um, who is an American colonist, very popular. In fact, the state of Pennsylvania was named after him. He was an American colonist who proposed a European parliament to prevent war. 
meaning that they wanted to have a unity amongst Europe, so-called Europeans to prevent any wars that would happen between them. Okay, to then, because with war comes peace, and with peace comes that unity that they would have one with another, which they formulated through these aspects of uh, different mental, you know, social exercises, right? Psychological exercises of having World War One and World War Two, which ultimately led to them being able to truly formulate this whole European Union and also what was known as NATO. That's essentially what William Penn was, was saying. William Penn understood that he wanted to formulate a NATO type of structure. NATO standing for North Atlantic Trade Organization, which basically has U.S. and Canada in league with uh, the whole of primarily rest Western Europe in a economic, social, political, and military union. Okay, So that's what you're seeing is the formulation of that particular unity. I'm not going to uh, kind of go into the rest of this, but what I'm going to do is we're just going to kind of go down and you're going to see how that unity came about. Between the two wars, that's how they ended up forming the unity and what led to what? The European Union, which you see here on the right. So when we go into this, you got what's called the European Union. Okay, this is how they consolidated their powers and their hegemony together under this and now this is one of the more powerful or the most powerful collective union on the planet in regards to economically okay and then when you add this in with NATO it's basically gives a lot of power that they're able to yield over the rest of the world because again Esau already controlled and has dominion over the earth uh, through its various wars and policies and uh, you know and people still willingly for hundreds of years submitting to it as we see now is beginning to break away and that's part of where there's a chink in their armor that's being exposed in these last days okay in fact and the fact that he also cannot hide himself as well now going back it says that remember that he increased in numbers and in strength extended their dominion towards the west and spread their colonies far and wide okay so let's let's look into that. Let's look up the Western world. Okay. Now, isn't it interesting that the Western world also includes <laughs> Australia as well, right? Because remember, if this was the Western world, why is this here and considered part of the Western world? Because the Western world is dealing with the dominion of Edom. Is they've been dealing with their dominion, okay? Because remember, they spread their colonies far and wide, right? This is far and wide. America to Australia, that's a far and wide of colonies for one set of people, all right? That were at one point a small nation of people, and then they began to increase in numbers and grow in strength, and then they took over, you know, many parts of the earth, okay? And even some of these areas that you don't see, they're not even showing you a little everything. They're not showing you South Africa, you know, they're not showing you, you know, they're not hitting you up with Turkey. They're not showing places like Goa in uh, Portugal, okay, which is a Portuguese colony. They're not showing you the Dutch colonies over in Indonesia, okay, and the French Indo-China area where they had influence in the area of Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, right? They're not showing you those things. They're letting you not think about that. They're not showing you the military bases here. They're not showing you Hong Kong, which was under the control of the British. Okay? <laughs> so you can imagine. They're not showing you Macau, China, which was under the control of the Portuguese. So we're so showing you that these people cannot be the sons of Japheth. And again, it's being proven with historical documents that were written long before us. And this is why you brothers and sisters, you have to understand that there's going to be people out there that are going to try and deflect because of the fact that they do not want Esau to be exposed. And what all people keep doing is helping Esau hide. Every time he gets exposed, somebody else is helping him run away. You're an accessory to a fugitive. You get charged with a crime when you try and hide a fugitive. That's in the law. You're basically an accessory, all right, for harboring a terrorist. That's what many of these people that are doing, that are out here, that are trying to deflect and run interference by saying that these people that are ruling the earth, that control these particular places that have put us into captivity, have slaughtered our people, raped and maimed them, stolen from them, 
are by them saying that they are not the Edomites and deflecting, you are again are harboring a terrorist. You are trying to hide him. And like the scripture says in Jeremiah 49 and 10, he shall not be able to hide himself. So no amount of things is going to basically be able to take away from the fact that he is under this particular, you know, exposure right now. He's being revealed in these last days. So the Western world includes, when we go down here, the Western culture is commonly said to include Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and all European member. Remember, the European hegemony, okay, was given to Edom. European member countries of EFTA and the EU, which is the European Union, European microstates, okay? And microstates is basically like your, your Monaco, your Luxembourgs, okay? Those type of places. Then it says the NATO military alliance, the United Kingdom and the United States. Isn't it interesting? This is how you know that this is being controlled right by the Edomites, okay? That's why it says also known as the West, okay? They spread their colonies far and wide. And then look what they're associated with. Ancient Greece and ancient Rome are generally concluded, considered to be the birthplace of Western civilization. Isn't that interesting? That Western civilization is started from Greece and Rome. That's why when you go back and, and remember, we just said that ancient Rome was what? The Edomites. Also in the same lesson, who was Esau Edom? Part one, ancient Greece, the associated with the same people. Just like if you go into the history of Macedonia, Philip, uh, Alexander the Great, you go into ha uh, Haman in the book of Esther from Macedonia, who was an Agagite. And Agagite is a descendant of Amalek, and Amalekite is a descendant of Esau. You see that there is a consistency with this. And how is it that ancient Greece and Rome went down as so-called empires and civilizations and then were rebirthed under what was known as the Western world or the West, okay, which is the time that we're in the, under that particular hegemony and control. So again, you're seeing the same old thing uh, that's matching up with what this book is saying, okay? So, and again, we're just going to go read this real quick and we'll finish it off. So again, first... That the descendants of Esau, the sworn enemies of the descendants of Jacob, even to the end of the world. Okay, and that sounds very familiar to a lot of you brothers and sisters. We're going to go into Second Ezra chapter six and verse nine. For Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of it that followeth. So hopefully this is edifying to you brothers and sisters. And again, I want to give all glory and praises to Yahweh Ba'asham Yahweh Shai. Grace and mercy be abound to the hopeful elect scattered throughout the four corners of the earth. Shalom.